Welcome to Insights at the Edge, produced by Sounds True. My name's Tammy Simon. I'm the founder of Sounds True, and I'd love to take a moment to introduce you to the new Sounds True Foundation. The Sounds True Foundation is dedicated to creating a wiser and kinder world by making transformational education widely available. We want everyone to have access to transformational tools such as mindfulness, emotional awareness, and self-compassion, regardless of financial, social, or physical challenges. The Sounds True Foundation is a nonprofit dedicated to providing these transformational tools to communities in need, including at-risk youth, prisoners, veterans, and those in developing countries. If you'd like to learn more or feel inspired to become a supporter, please visit SoundsTrueFoundation.org. You're listening to Insights at the Edge. Today, my guest is Kristen Leal. Kristen is a yoga teacher and a sadhaka in the Ishta lineage, as well as a licensed massage therapist, Reiki practitioner, and an author. Her popular meta-anatomy workshops, classes, and online trainings blend serious scientific knowledge with a sense of humor and a deep connection to the divine within us all. With Sounds True, Kristen has written a new book. It's called Meta-Anatomy, a modern yogi's practical guide to the physical and energetic anatomy of your amazing body In the book, she helps readers develop a new level of body literacy, a deep and vital relationship with the physical, emotional, and energetic aspects of your being. In our podcast, I have Kristen guide us into some pretty interesting exercises where we enter the true world of wonder, the wonder that is you and me, the wonder that is us. Take a listen. To begin with, Kristen, I know you grew up as a dancer. What brought you to yoga from dance? I think it was the injuries. (laughs) I think uh, uh, dance is a beautiful art form, one that I really enjoy and love and um, think has a lot of potential to it, but it also, for me, my experience of it, it focused on uh, almost my lack. (laughs) You know, I I wasn't flexible enough or strong enough or um, as good as I needed to be. There was always like a striving to it, and it broke down my body, (laughs) Uh, not surprisingly. What kind Um, of dance were you doing? I started with ballet when I was a a child, a kid, and then um, worked in a a second company, a junior company, doing ballet. And then when I moved to New York, modern dance uh, became uh, what I most enjoyed. But it's a different way of, for me, it was a different relationship with my body, you know, one of not being enough. And I think my friend Tanya dragged me to a, a, a yoga class and she was a fellow dancer and she obviously resonated with something in that. And being able to move my body in that way that was more of a, a curiosity and more of a um, not needing to know what it was supposed to look like, just feeling, was a whole different world for me. Um, and so I, I, I really quickly fell in love with that uh, that relationship uh, um, more so than the more unhealthy one I had with dance. And what about this interest in anatomy? A lot of people who love yoga maybe develop, you know, a little fluency and a little bit of anatomy, but you've gone deep. <laughs> Crazy. Is that what you mean? <laughs> Well, I'm just, yeah, you could say that. You're, you're a meta-anatomy crazy person. So uh, talk a little bit about what drew you in and how this became such a passion for you. 
I think I've just always loved the body, understanding the body from a young age in school. I had really great teachers, science teachers, biology teachers that really um, uh, gave me extra material, extra books. They stayed after school with me. They did all they, they really went beyond to because um, they I think they saw the interest. And also my mom, my mom is a nurse or was a nurse. She's no longer practicing. But um, I just realized that, you know, uh, family members, my, my mom's family is quite large, and family members would always be calling her for advice or to explain things to, to them. And, and overhearing all of those conversations, I just thought, you know, she's just so knowledgeable, and she's able to calm people and and give them information that's that's empowering and soothing and i think that really had a a big impact on me wanting to to know more and to study and to be like that um and kind of concurrent with finding yoga i went to school for massage therapy so a deeper study of the body um from a muscle and bone perspective, along with the yoga study of the body from a more felt experiential uh, uh, level. Um, it's just always been something that's been really fascinating to me. And your new book is called Meta-Anatomy. For people who are hearing that word for the first time, Meta-Anatomy, what's that? Yeah, I savagely stole that, I think. <laughs> from a, a, a wonderful teacher, Tom Myers. I think it was in a book uh, and it was almost a thrown, it seemed like a thrown, thrown away kind of term. It wasn't really focused on in the book, but he mentioned something of the meta anatomy of this region. And I, it just hit me that it, it, it was just one of those moments that I was like, that's it. That's what I want to study is there's kind of two different ways to think about it. The word meta, the prefix meta, means like to go beyond. So like metaphysics, to go beyond physics or metacarpal, to go beyond the carpals, right? So it was my attempt to go beyond this, um, how I first studied anatomy, which was cutting things apart, separating them, labeling them. This is the origin and this is the insertion. You know, this is the nerve. This is what it does. This very kind of cut and dry and binary and um, view of separation of, of anatomy. And to go beyond that, to, to look at the body as already whole and holy, right? And to utilize like a meta-analysis to taking taking all of these different studies of how yogis view the body, how um, traditional Chinese medicine views the body, how an uh, anatomist would view the body, and combining them to a larger experience, uh, a larger understanding, an unraveling, an unfolding uh, of, of the body, and our experience of being in these bodies. Right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I think I needed a bigger word. <laughs> <laughs> than just, you know, anatomy or yoga anatomy. I needed the meta. Mm -hmm. And for a moment, if you were addressing yourself to yoga teachers, what do you think they often miss about the human anatomy that you're trying to bring into their awareness through meta anatomy? I think it's that misunderstanding. I think a lot of times when I meet students the first day of a teacher training program, there's often um, a resistance or they're hesitant or they just think it's going to be dry and boring and they don't have the mind for it. And do we really need to like label all these things and learn this new language, you know? And I, I want to... Um, I aim to teach in a way that's um, not about memorizing, but by but getting curious and uh, uh, experiencing the body, right? Not just kind of writing it down and getting it right on a test, right? But really experiencing the body in its in its fullness, um, with all of these different layers to excavate. Um, I want people to know that it's exciting. That it's not, mm -hmm. it's the furthest thing from dry and boring and pedantic. It's, it's, 
it is the, the study of you and how amazing and cool you are. <laughs> like, uh, I want people to know that. Well, it's clearly a very exciting topic to you, very, very clearly. And uh, it's infectious. You created a video series, Kristen Leal Crushes on Anatomy. <laughs> and uh, I, I watched uh, one of the video clips and you were talking about the nervous system and describing the nervous system as one of the, the sexiest parts of the body. I don't know, most people maybe if they thought, what are the sexiest parts of the body might not nominate the nervous system, but you did. So tell me why you think the nervous system is sexy, but also even more importantly, uh, you teach a workshop called Hacking Our Nervous System. How can we start understanding our nervous system in a useful way? It is sexy. It is the sexiest of systems because any other part of the body that you're already thinking maybe is sexier is innervated by the nervous system and it's not working unless the nervous system is working. Good right? point. <laughs> so so I think it's the the king and the queen of of our body systems and I think really the path of all these wonderful things that we see in meditation and yoga and all these benefits and and how science is really kind of looking at these things and trying to devise studies and and um, illuminate these different benefits that it might have. It all stems from being um, a more powerful owner of your nervous system, so you can be um, you, uh, you can. Uh, uh, become uh, you can become more powerful in your nervous system, meaning you can realize by becoming yoked to the present moment, right? Beca becoming aware of where you are and what you're feeling and what's going on, you can then start to make choices and use tools, uh, breathing techniques or yoga techniques or um, meditation techniques you can use techniques to bring about different states in your physiology, which really means different moods, right? So it's really becoming a, a more powerful creator um, uh, rather than being just kind of dictated by life, um, how you're going to respond. You actually get to choose. Well, well, let's talk more about that because I think a, a lot of people don't feel like they are a powerful owner of their nervous system. They feel like their nervous system is running the show. So particularly in times of uh, great uncertainty, chaos, uh, rapid accelerated change, people are just, they're freaked out. So my question to you would be uh, in terms of helping people learn some really simple techniques that can make them feel more in charge of their nervous system, what do you suggest? Yeah, I don't want to make it sound like it's um, easy. It's simple, but not easy, right? So really the most powerful way to interact with your own nervous system, with your own physiology, is your breath, right? And right under your nose. <laughs> right? It's, it's that as close as the nose on your face. So the ability, um, once you start to learn these techniques, and I think once you start learning and loving your own anatomy, you start to recognize that different nostril dominance will bring about different states in your autonomic nervous system, right? So whether you are needing to engage in a moment or you're needing to soften to a moment, right? You can stimulate a different state by stimulating a certain nostril dominance. Your right nostril is really tied to your sympathetic nervous system, which is your engagement system, right? Some people call it the fight or flight, which is cool. It's correct. And, and, and many anatomy books will say that. But when it's revved up to 10, it's the fight or flight system. But you and I right now have to be on like a three <laughs> of our sympathetic to be having a conversation, to be engaged in the moment, to be present, to be like thinking and, and knowing your next question. And we have to be masterful of our engagement system. So it might behoove us to make our right nostril more predominant by doing different techniques from many different traditions, but the yoga tradition I come from, Surya Vedana, 
right? Uh, uh, inhaling through the right, out through the left, kind of uh, for a couple minutes, right? That's going to activate a little bit more sympathetic nervous system. But if you're really looking to chill out, you know, and you need to relax or you need to go to sleep, we want to elicit a more relaxation response or parasympathetic activation. And your left nostril is connected to that parasympathetic. So if you make your left nostril predominant, more chill out, more relaxation response. So in my tradition, we call it Chandra Vedana. We bring about that kind of moon lunar energy in the left nostril in through the left, out through the right for a couple of minutes, right? Well, this is highly, highly practical and I love it. And I wonder, Kristen, uh, if you'd be willing, uh, we can move into the experiential segment of our podcast. And I think I, it might be great to actually further uh, activate our engagement system uh, to start, and then maybe we'll relax a little bit. Can we do both of these, and can you teach us how to do it? And the reason I'm I'm wanting that is I think it would be great for people to know that they have this tool readily available to them. And it sounds like it's pretty something pretty easy for us to learn how to do. Yeah, there's several ways into it. There's the way I mentioned, or playing with the length of your inhale or exhale. There's there's lots of different ways to. Um, meet your nervous system. So I'm happy to, to uh, guide us through that. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Okay. So um, wherever you find yourself, just find a comfortable seat. So whether that's in a chair or on the floor, feet on the floor, something where your spine can be tall, but fairly easy. And if it's possible to do so, you can close your eyes. Before the need to quickly change yourself, your situation, your physiology, just simply take a moment to feel where you are. So whether that's a sensation in your body, whether that's the presence of your breath somewhere in the nostrils, in the chest, in the belly, Or maybe it's a particular mood or state of mind, whether it's super easy to concentrate right now or it's a bit fleeting. Without really having to label anything like this is the good way, the right way, the bad way, just simply acknowledging that it is what it is in this moment. And with the eyes closed, you can lift your right hand and just gently block the left nostril And taking a slower, deeper breath in through the right. Sip in even more breath than you think you can. Letting the collarbones lift, maybe it even lets you sit up a little bit taller. Close, block both. And then as you need to, no rush, but as you need, you'll exhale through the left side. Just continue on like that at whatever pace is reasonable for you, inhaling through the right, there's no need to struggle or gasp or like there's no gold star for holding your breath the longest, just inhale through the right, when you are at the top of your inhale, just calmly close both sides of your nose. And then as you ready, exhale through the left nostril. And just do this another few rounds at your own pace. So 
we call this uh, technique Surya Vedana, bring about the solar, masculine, heated, active, sympathetic activation. In through the right, out through the left. If you need a little recovery breath, if you're a little stuffed up or you're getting a little bit heated, take a breath in and out through both nostrils, a little break, and then come back to it if you desire. In through the right, out through the left. Taking just one more like that. Take your time. At the end of that exhale, just lower your hand back down into your lap or on your thigh. Take just a few moments to feel whatever there is there to feel. A sensation in your body. presence of your breath. State of the mind or emotional body. And just become aware of the part of you that's been watching this whole shenanigan, this whole thing. The part of you that's remained distinct or undisturbed, curious, watchful. The part of you as witness or what we call in my tradition, the jiva. Her throne is said to be in the heart. And just if you'd like, just float one hand up to your own heart. And you can feel maybe the beat of your heart or the movement of your breath, the pulse in the vessels. Just quite literally the visceral participation with where you are. Which leads us back to the recognition of who we are. Bow your head towards that remembrance or recognition. As you feel ready, you can let your eyes flutter open. Wonderful. So that was a solar practice. And we would just do the opposite if we were looking for the lunar yeah. practice. We could do that to close if you'd like. <laughs> okay, we'll come we'll come back to that and, and I don't and want do people that. to fall asleep. Yeah, and do that at the end. Very good. Uh, first of all, you're a beautiful teacher. So thank you and thanks for sharing that. And secondly, I notice when you use the term solar and lunar, it just feels so much easier for me to remember which part of the nervous system. I I love referencing it like that in the natural world. Yeah. You know, all of these things are just maps. The Western, I had a, um, when I was a kid, I had um, one of those posters on my wall of a muscle man, like front and back of a muscle man and everything was labeled. That's a map. And, And there's this great teacher, Gil Headley. I don't know if you know who he is. Um, but he's an amazing anatomist, and he uh, says maps are meant to be useful, not real, which really rocked my world. <laughs> because when you see an actual body, that's not really r- what it looks like. Like everything is not subdivided and neat and pretty, and it's it's all this like mess of interconnected tissue, right? So that's just one map, 
And then we have the map and models of the yogis, of the energetic body, the felt experiential body, right? Those are maps and models, like the the nadis and the chakras and the vayus and um, the emotional body, right? If I said, I love you, we're more likely to point to our heart than our nose, like I love you, right? We're more likely to point to our heart, right? These are all just different maps and models of you, you know, so whether we're using the natural world, the, the macrocosm, the microcosm of our own bodies, they're just different maps and they're meant to be useful. So whatever map is useful, <laughs> whatever gets you in there. There's something else I've heard in our conversation so far that I just want to highlight. In the very beginning, when you were talking about your move from dance to yoga, you talked about how in the dance world, there was this emphasis on getting it right and feeling like you were getting it wrong or that your body wasn't quite in the right shape to do X, Y, Z. And what I felt as you led us in that uh, solar breathing was this deep, unconditional love and reverence for the body, just in the way that you led us through it. And I'm wondering if you can talk some about that, how you came to that in your own experience. I think a lot of people have a complicated relationship with their body? Um, I have a complicated relationship with my body. I think as a, as a woman, maybe it's my only experience, but I um, didn't, the not enough ish, (laughs) it comes up quite a lot. Um, And it's really hard for my brain to hold uh, my thighs are too big. My thighs are too big for these pairs of pants. My thighs are too big for this pose. My thighs are too big for society, whatever. To hold that thought and to hold the thought of, uh, I'm creating 2 million red blood cells every second. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> like, to hold those thoughts of like how freaking amazing my body is and what a miracle it is. And to hold the um, not enough isms that come up, I have a hard time holding them both at the same time. So the more that I can celebrate, uh, the more that I can do my practice that allows me to remember that truth, the quieter uh, uh, the voice of my thighs are too big becomes, right? It, it's It's been... Uh, an evolving relationship <laughs> and like every relationship has its ups and downs, but, um, but it helps me to remember who I am and who I am beyond the meat suit, right? Uh, the meat suit gets criticized quite a lot in my brain, but when you have a daily practice of remembering who you are beneath, beyond the meat suit, um, it becomes a little easier to love yourself because you remember that you are love. The whole ground substance of everything is this love. So when you dip your feet into it every day or take a full on dive into it every day, um, the other voices quiet down. I, I noticed too, just that very simple act at the end of the meditation of bowing our head to our heart. That's really powerful bowing to that remembrance exactly to that reunion the remembrance the recognition um it's reverence Mm -hmm. now Kristen, in meta anatomy you reference your two main yoga teachers alan finger and rod striker and what i'd love to know is if you had to boil it down for us the biggest most important one or two things you learned from each of them, the things that really drew you to them as teachers, where you said, okay, I'm in, I'm going to study deeply with this person. What were they? I met Alan first. I think I met Rod actually first, Yoga Rupa Rod Stryker first, but I wasn't ready. I think I was 18. He came to the studio that I was um, studying at and I didn't understand a word he was saying. <laughs> so, so, but, but then, you know, after a decade or something of study, I met Alan Finger, uh, Yogi Raj Alan Finger. And 
he's the parasympathetic nervous system. Like he is, he is joy. He is, um, he is, you are already enough. There's nowhere to go. There's nothing to do. You are already enough. And my goodness, laugh at this whole situation. <laughs> like, find, find the funny in this situation. Make bad jokes. Like, you know, um, uh, he taught me to not take myself too seriously, right? Even though this is very serious work. But to not take my, that, that taking yourself too seriously is actually an impediment to the work, impediment to your understanding and your ultimate connection, right? So he really taught me, he, by his example, he taught me that, right? Then after maybe 10 or so years with um, Alan, I re, uh, I, I found again um, Yoga Rupa, uh, Rod Stryker, and He's a serious guy. <laughs> I know he has a, a book coming out um, with Sounds True, and um, he is so knowledgeable. And so he holds the teachings with such reverence and sacredness. And um, he's so smart. Um, and he, I, I think he's the other side of the coin that I needed. Right. It is. Everything is fine. You are fine. You are perfect. You are whole. And there is work to be done. Right. And there are some patterns that are perhaps uh, causing you to constantly forget <laughs> your wholeness. And there are some patterns that might be affecting your relationships or um, with, with yourself or with other people that there is still work to be done. And it's difficult and it's gnarly and it's um, not comfortable and it's not full of joy. And <laughs> it's all of those things. Um, and I think that uh, having both of those sides, being able to meet both of those men has been a real gift to know myself as whole, to find joy, but also be brave enough to go into the darkness to also be brave enough to, um, to work there. Um, I, I don't think I could have had one without the other. It wouldn't have been, I, it wouldn't have been a complete practice for me. It was your solar lunar combination. It really is. It, it's, um, I never thought about it like that until this moment, but it, it really is. And you need both, whether we're talking about the nervous system or these types of of understanding this, this understanding, you need both. Um, one is not more uh, valuable than the other. You just need different things at different times. Meta anatomy is a really, really rich, interesting, and full book. There's a lot in it. The first section, uh, as you use that phrase, is about the meat suit that we have, our physical world. The second section is what you call the poetic about our subtle body. And then the third section has lots of practical applications and exercises that you can do to embody this in, in your own life. And first of all, calling the second section poetic, I, I had a question about that. I mean, I think most people probably would have said, oh, let's just call it energetic. It's energetic. Why use the word poetic? How we need poetry. If I'm going to try to explain to you what goes on in this meat suit, like the experience of being alive in this meat suit, I need metaphor. I need poetry. I need like a whole different language. Like I can say, I can talk to you about the meat suit and be like, this is the biceps brachii and, and, you know, and have very kind of literal talk. But when I dive inside and talk about my emotions or a feeling of movement of energy in my body. I need a different set of language. I need, I need the poetry to, to describe uh, all the stuff going on inside. And in this poetic section, there was a chapter on breath and the four diaphragms that really got my attention. And there's so many different places we could choose to dive in, but I'm going to choose this uh, diving in place. 
And I think, first of all, it's because I never knew I had four <laughs> diaphragms. So I was a little bit like, I have four diaphragms? What's going on? So uh, can you explain that? You know, depending on who you talk to, you might have many more. <laughs> If you've ever uh, looked into the work of Bonnie Bainbridge Cohen and and different, you know, really remarkable teachers, depending on what you'd like to call a diaphragm, you could have, you know, a couple dozen <laughs> in your body. Um, but I think it's a way of experiencing, you know, as yogis, I think sometimes we can we can start to experience of our our uh, you could start to experience our breath as not just trapped in our rib cage or not just in one part of our rib cage, but we start to have this feeling that we could breathe into our fingertips or down into our toes, or we can kind of guide and move the breath in all these different fantastic ways. And I think understanding the four diaphragms, um, I call them the inner jellyfish, you can start to reconnect to their movements like you'd um, like, a, I don't know a lot about jellyfish anatomy, but you've got the kind of jellyfish head and you've got the little legs that, that dangle down. Right. And when you see them gliding in the water in the whole school of jellyfish gliding together, you can see that kind of undulation that, and, and how it affects their little feet and it affects the water around them. And, and you start to, to, cue in when you learn these diaphragms in your body, these muscle and cartilage and fascia kind of making up these, these uh, different uh, diaphragms, you can start to see them swimming uh, when you're taking these more thoughtful, longer um, exploration of breath. You can start to feel their movement reconnect. You're not even really creating it. You're just reconnecting to it. And that gives you such a... Um, a more full experience of your body breathing, right? Because breath is really, if you talk to an anatomist, it's the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide, but it's the cell in your pinky finger that desires that exchange. And on your big toe and in your hungry, hungry brain, it's got to move. And and when we get subtle enough and, and clever enough, we can we can start to sense the, the movement of that breath. Globally. Okay. So can you introduce me to these four inner jellyfish <laughs> that I have that I'm not familiar yeah. with? Yeah. So the, um, my favorite four are, um, one is at the, one is the most familiar. So it's actually called the thoracic diaphragm. It kind of separates you into top and bottom pieces and it kind of circumnavigates the last six ribs on either side. So this is the one that people are more familiar with. And when it contracts, um, it draws down and that pulls on the lungs and the tissue around the lungs to bring breath into the body. And then as it relaxes and it domes upward, it helps to expel the air. Right? So that's the one that most people are, are familiar with or could visualize um, when you first start studying anatomy or yoga. The other a little bit more subtle ones are at the pelvic floor. So kind of a combination of a bunch of different muscles at the base from pubic bone to tailbone to two sitting bones and forming the bottom of your torso. And it also has movement with the breath. It also does that same thing where it draws down on the inhale and domes back in and up uh, towards the crown, towards the head on the exhale. You have the vocal diaphragm which is made up of mostly cartilage and some other types of tissue, a little bit of muscle. And this is kind of right around the um, uh, where your vocal cords are, kind of upper neck. And it also, uh, I like to think of this one as, uh, you know, at a, a big opera house, they have those red velvet curtains that kind of dramatically open at the start of the show and then billow close uh, at the end of the show. And this is kind of like your vocal diaphragm or jellyfish, where it opens and draws slightly down to allow the passage of air in, and then it domes and billows closed to, to move the air out. I'm doing kind of big movements and saying big words, but, but this is, you know, a very subtle movement of the throat. And then most refined, most beautiful, most um, subtle is a layer of tissue around the brain uh, called meninges, the the layer of fascia, kind of a gift wrap around the brain, and it too has movement with the breath, albeit extremely subtle. It too draws slightly down 
on the inhale and slightly up on the exhale. And so all four of these jellyfish, when you get quiet and you're breathing deeper, you can. it is possible to tune in like a school of jellyfish moving together, um, uh, participating, allowing, opening, expanding, softening to each breath. Wow. I'm especially interested in the vocal diaphragm and the brain diaphragm. I've never been introduced to those before. I wonder, could you just take us through a minute or two of breathing into both of those diaphragms? Would that be all right? Just so people could experientially touch it? Yeah, right absolutely. So you're welcome to do this seated or lying down, whatever is useful for you. And it is helpful if you feel comfortable to do so to close the eyes. So we get a little bit more subtle into the body. Um, sometimes the visual distractions around us will pull us out. So if you can close your eyes and feel safe to do so, uh, go ahead and do it. If you're driving, don't do that. <laughs> but if not, close your eyes. And just to make it a little easier perhaps to feel, just start to deepen your breath. Nothing crazy, nothing wild. Just a slower, longer inhale, a slower, longer exhale. Maybe just like 30% of your breath capacity, just slower. And if you know ujjayi pranayam, kind of that um, oceanic sound of breath by hugging the vocal folds, almost like you're whispering, that kind of hug you would have in the vocal folds. Just apply the very gentlest version of that. I almost um, feel like it's drinking, um, it's almost like drinking a really thick milkshake, but through a small straw. Right? It's gonna take more of your effort, but you can savor the milkshake for longer. So we're savoring the breath by making a smaller straw. And as you feel the breath moving in through the nose, it takes a little bit of a turn downwards into the tubes of the throat and right above the upper palate. And on its journey down into the lungs, it picks up that vibration at the throat. This is almost like those curtains kind of being uh, drawn together. And to allow that fullness of the inhale, you can feel the curtains billowing out to the side, drawing down towards the earth and opening to allow the breath in, to allow the inspiration just the fancy pants way of saying inhale. And as you exhale and air is moving now from the lungs up through the tubes of the throat, back out through the nose, like curtains being blown by the breeze, the curtains are closing and drawing up towards the crown. The inhale and curtains are drawing down and open to allow breath to move in. And 
And on the exhale, they're doming back in and up towards the crown. Keeping the breath moving gentle and slow and just start to lift your awareness to the point that is often described as the third eye, the soft space between your two eyebrows. And there's some uh, kind of fascial gift wrap around the brain that is also billowing in the breeze of your breath. You can think of the borders of that third eye and your two temples and the back point of the head that you might put a ponytail on. These delicate lace-like tissues responsive to the breath. I almost think of it sometimes like my grandmother's doilies, it's fine lace. Billowing in your breath and on your inhale, the center point is drawing down towards your feet, towards the earth. In the exhale, it's doming back in and up towards the crown. It is the most subtle of movements, but can you feel on the inhale the center point of that diaphragm drawing down towards the earth to allow inspiration to pour in from crown down the body. In the exhale, it's doming in and up towards the crown. Allowing that inspiration to now move through you. And relax your breath and notice maybe even in your relaxed breath where you're no longer fussing with it or stretching it or trying to manipulate it. There might be even in this most subtle of diaphragms, a remembrance of that movement, a, an acknowledgement of that movement. The body Breathing, it loves you so much. It is breathing even without your dictatorship. And as you're ready, again, bowing your head towards your heart. Just a moment of gratitude for whatever your experience. So you feel ready, you can allow the eyes to open and coming back into your space. Kristen, I had no idea that there was a jellyfish <laughs> inside my head and inside my throat. No idea. <laughs> Absolutely no idea. So thank you You're welcome. <laughs> for that. Uh, you know, for me, just the wonder of it is enough of a turn on. But for that listener who's saying, uh, okay, why do I care? Like with the alternate nostril breathing, it was there was a clear purpose mm -hmm. to, oh, I'm going to shift my nervous system for a reason. W why would discovering these other diaphragms in the body be particularly useful for someone? 
Well, I, I can come up with about 50 reasons. <laughs> um, I think just physically, these are areas of held tension for many people, right? So uh, a physical tension in your thoracic diaphragm or in your pelvic diaphragm can affect your your genital, your sexual health, your um, uh, it can cause pain or disruption of, of, of function or movement, right? Uh, problems in your thoracic, uh, pain, disruption of movement, uh, not the ability to not get in the breath that your body deserves, right? Vocal, brain, these these can all in a physical way hold tension and therefore not be op uh, optimal, right? And optimal functioning. Also energetically in, in one map or model, these are the placements of what the yogis call the grantis, which are these more kind of energetic knots that will prevent, if they're tied too tight, let's say, it will prevent ascension of energy upwards. So transformation or reconnection to source or reconnection to self or whatever word you'd like to call it, um, that energy won't be uh, as available to you right, if these knots are tied too tight. So working with the breath physically and energetically, physiologically, can change you, right? Um, and I, I just think the more we understand about ourselves, whatever map we're using is useful because this world is tough. <laughs> it is rough out there. And I need a map, you know, like I, I need some help. I need some guidance um, and I need to be able to navigate these waters. And so I think the more we can understand ourselves on whatever level is of benefit to ourselves. And then we have to interact with a lot of people. So it's going to be of, of benefit to others and our society and our social groups and our world. Um, but it starts in and it might start with your breath. Now, just to ask you a question uh, from someone who doesn't know that much about these yogic maps, you mentioned these knots that are connected to these different diaphragms that we can discover through this breathing. Is the goal to totally untie these knots or just to loosen them so we have more fluidity and flexibility? I would say thinking of it more as loosening or having the ability uh, to, to open or close. These knots are said to hold our consciousness in our body. So as a tantrika, as, as someone that studies tantra, we both we want both ascension, communion, um, uh, to, um, to go beyond, but we also want to live in this world. And we want to take that experience of our wholeness and our connection and our union and not just be a jerk in our life to bring that back into our relationships, into our body, right? We want to be embodied. Um, and so we want our consciousness to be held in our form. Otherwise, we're just out of here. Um, so we want to have the ability to do both. We want it to be a two-way mm -hmm. two highway, a two-lane highway, right? Uh-huh. Very good. Now, you know, as I said, we're just picking one small section of meta-anatomy. Uh, we could, there's so many different aspects of our poetic and physical anatomy that we could be digging into here. And I just picked this one thing about the four diaphragms because I found it particularly interesting. And when uh, I asked you about it, you said, oh, some people say we have even more than that. And quite honestly, when you said that, I felt confused. I was like, okay, I'm just going to roll. I just want to first get the four down before I go into more. But uh, after we did the practice together, I actually started feeling into what you meant potentially by that, that this expansion and contraction force is happening in our total meta-anatomy in a lot of different ways at a lot of different levels. And I, I wonder if you could help me understand that more. Oh, that's so beautiful. Um, I think we can experience that expansiveness and tethering back in that, that like a jellyfish swimming, right? We can experience that globally in our body. There's, there's some maps, you know, that the most common maps say like seven chakras, the, the ones that are most talked about. And you see pictures on, um, 
yoga studios everywhere of the seven chakras. But there are some books that say like every joint is a chakra, right? Or every, you know, that you have any, uh, any place where three nadis meet is a chakra, is another um, uh, learning from Yoga Rupa. And you have 72,000 or so nadis in the body, <laughs> according to some maps. So there's a lot of crossover. So I think it's, a, it's available to you to start to tap into these qualities of opening and expansiveness and, and inspiration and softening and tethering back and expiring, letting go um, many places in the body. It's just these are kind of the gatekeepers uh, uh, in the torso, right, in the middle of mm -hmm. your form. Um, and then for someone who's feeling confused at this moment because they thought, okay, I thought I had seven chakras. Mm -hmm. I was kind of getting the hang of it. I'd read about it. Okay, color, <laughs> sound, mantra for each chakra. But now Kristen's telling me that at all of the intersections, potentially of three or more of these 72,000 nadis, there are more chakras. Whoa, I'm in some kind of uh, hologram <laughs> of either possibility or confusion. That's where you want to be, isn't it? Oh, okay, good. <laughs> well, well, then that's where, that's where I am. That's well, where you don't we want to be like, I got this. I know everything. You want to open yourself to the mystery of it. There's so many different texts and there's so many different lineages and maps. And this is just yoga, which I'm more familiar with. And and only know probably 10% of, you know, uh, of the grand teachings of. So there's uh, TCM, traditional Chinese medicine, there's um, indigenous people's medicine, there's, there's so many different maps and models. Maps are meant to be useful, not real. So I think if you start to lock down, there are seven chakras, and this is their location, and this is how they move, and we have to uh, wear only orange you know, and then, or whatever, then we we get limited. By its nature, it's no longer real, right? But if we keep opening our hearts and our minds to the mystery, and like, and to and to not have to take anyone's word for it, to try these maps and models for yourself and have your own embodied experience, then that's autonomy. Then that's like, uh, that's yours, right? That's your lived experience that has value, right? That is valid. Now, uh, you know, as I mentioned, we could take any one toe, finger, elbow, whatever, within the meta-anatomy whole series of teachings and go really deep. And there's a lot there. But I want to make sure in this conversation, if there are any what we could call meta-anatomy essential principles that you've had the opportunity to share them. Have we missed anything really important that you, you know, when you think of meta anatomy, this is what I want to make sure you are taking away. We, we've talked about wonder. So I think yeah. that part's we're, we're there on that. I think maybe takeaways, you have a body and it's amazing. And you are more than your body, right? You have the power of your own breath to change <laughs> your physiology, your mood, your energy. Um, and I think the more we look in and understand ourselves, the more we have a chance of understanding others <laughs> and our world around us and our path becomes clearer. So. It starts often with the microcosm of your big toe <laughs> or your diaphragm or your nervous system, but really ultimately to understand our place in the world and our interconnectedness. When you, when you look at anatomy as just separate parts like a, a robot, it's, you know, then it becomes easy to think of like things breaking on that robot and then fixing them and you know, making them perfect, upgrading the system. And, you know, we don't really work that way. We are these flawed, perfect, interconnected, interdependent, interwoven systems that can't be separated. And I think that understanding, if we're looking at anatomy, if uh, coming to that re recognition or realization in our anatomy helps us to remember that you and I, are not these 
robots that need to be fixed or are broken or, you know, that we are whole and we are interconnected and interwoven and interdependent, right? Um, I think I think that's what I'd like the takeaway of the book to be or my work to be. All right. We promised our listeners that we would end with some lunar breathing. So this is the kind of breathing I could do when I want to relax. Yeah. I'm too uptight. I'm too wound up. This is what I'm going to do. All right. Let's do it together. All right. So finding your seat, whatever is work, working for you. Close your eyes if it's available to you. Before we begin, just notice any shifts. Notice where your body is now in this new moment of now. The sensations, the breath. the state of the mind, state of your energy or emotion. In the ever-shifting moment of now, just notice where you are first. And then if possible, lifting your right hand and blocking your right nostril with your thumb. As you're ready, taking a longer breath in, slower breath in through your left nostril. Just doing the best you can. As you get to the very top of your breath, just close both sides of the nose gently. And then as you're ready, no rush, as you're ready, exhale slowly through your right nostril. I'm going to do that a few times. You're going to inhale through the left nostril. Close. And when you need to exhale slowly, completely, fully through the right nostril. Continuing on at a pace that feels reasonable to you. In through the left, out through the right. Call it Chandra, meaning moon, Vedana, uh, piercing, So bringing about the lunar, cooling, feminine, passive, meditative, parasympathetic activation. Chilling out. In through the left, out through the right. If possible, seeing if you can really linger in that exhale. Kind of luxuriating in it a bit. In through the left, out through the right. It's taking another two rounds or so. At the end, the very bottom, the emptiest place of your exhale, just lower your hand. Let the breath regulate on its own, just natural breath in and out. Bowing your head towards your heart and just reflecting on any new sensation, new awareness, 
shifting. And of course, the place in you that is unbound, infinite potential. As you're ready, you can allow yourself to gently come back into your space. And that's Kristen Leol. What a beautiful, a humble, and fun teacher you are. It's been so great to be with you. It's been an honor. Your book, Meta Anatomy, a modern yogi's practical guide to the physical and energetic anatomy of your amazing body. It's the kind of book you want to keep on your shelf, learn from, and refer to. It's packed. Meta Anatomy by Kristen Leal. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to Insights at the Edge. You can read a full transcript of today's interview at soundstrue.com forward slash podcast. And if you're interested, hit the subscribe button in your podcast app. And also, if you feel inspired, head to iTunes and leave Insights at the Edge a review. I love getting your feedback, being in connection with you, and learning how we can continue to evolve and improve our program. Working together, I believe, we can create a kinder and wiser world. Soundstrue.com, waking up the world.